All right, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, reading out of the NASB version. Well, before I do that, I want to read, you don't have to turn there, but I want to read to another, I'll read another verse to you. This is the Lord. This is Luke 11, 1. It came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John, he's talking about John the Baptist, also taught his disciples. And so here we are in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. He said, Jesus tells his disciples, pray then in this way. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so in just a moment, we're going to preach a little bit on Lord, teach us to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would teach me to preach, Lord. I pray that as I spend time in your presence, Lord, you would teach me to speak for you, Lord, the way that you would have your word spoken, O oh Lord. And Holy Spirit, I pray that your anointing would cause your word to reach into the people's hearts, Lord, and that it would effect change in them because you're the only one that can change things in our lives, O oh Lord God. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. And so they said, Lord, teach us to pray. You know, it would have been, it would have been interesting to see where that situation really was happening. You know, where they were. Was Jesus behind the rock? Were they right there with him? Did he, when he started off in prayer, what was it that grabbed a hold of them that they were like, Lord, teach us to pray? Because we realize now that we probably don't really know how to pray, right? And, and you know, there's another spot in Luke chapter 18. You don't have to really turn now. I'm just going to read through some of these. It says, he spoke a parable to them to this end that men ought always to pray and not faint. And the idea of fainting needs to grow weary to be exhausted. This parable, he's talking about this woman, this old widow, okay, who kept knocking on the judge's door. And the, and the Bible says that the judge was wicked, but that the judge was, he said, if I don't answer her, if I don't take care of justice for her, she is going to wear me out. And then the Lord tells this parable. And then at the end in verse eight of Luke 18, he says this, nevertheless, when the son of man comes, Shall he find faith on the earth? So he said, men ought always to pray and not grow faint. Then he tells the story. Then he says, but nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? The question is, is that when he returns, what he's saying is, when I come back, will I find people actually walking in faith? Will people really be praying or will they have grown faint? Will they have become exhausted? Will they have grown weary? Will they have quit? Mark 135 says that long before the break of day, the Lord would get alone in a solitary place and there he would pray. I put a little side note. I'm not saying you have to wake up early in the morning. That's not what I'm saying in that, but I'm just telling you what the Lord did. Long before the break of day, the Lord got alone in a solitary place, and there he prayed. What I am saying is that nothing should come between you and prayer. What I'm trying to say is if you got to wake up early in the morning, then you need to wake up early in the morning. If it's best for you to pray at midnight, then you need to pray at midnight. But nothing, and especially not sleep, should get in the way of you in prayer, especially if you're going to be a disciple of the Lord, especially if you're really going to serve him and to be one of those that when he comes back, he finds faith on the earth. Amen. Yeah. Hebrews 5 in, in verse 7 says this, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, when Jesus prayed, he prayed, there was some emotion, at least sometimes when he prayed. I'm not saying that it was always like this, but at least sometimes when Jesus prayed, strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and he was heard in that he feared. Amen. Hallelujah. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Amen. Hallelujah. See, I don't think it's supposed to be a bead on a, on a necklace. Come on, somebody. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I mean, I'm not trying to poke nobody in the eye, but I'm not, I'm not going to shrink back from the truth. It's not supposed to just be a, a bead every few beads that I just re repetitiously pray a prayer. As a matter of fact, the Lord said the heathen pray in vain repetition. Mm -hmm. 
so what it, so what it is is it's, a, it's actually an I believe it's an outline. It's a it's an algorithm or it's a blueprint of prayer. Let's just start with our Father and see how far we can get with that. That's how Jesus addressed God. He addressed Him as Father. I cannot think of a greater relationship of intimacy that there could be other than between a child and their father. At least that's the way it's supposed to be, right? And we know that, that sin has entered the earth, and we know that sin has messed up many a father. I'll probably mention something in my message at some point about that. But what I'm trying to say is, is that what can bring greater comfort to the heart of a child than intimacy with their father? Uh, can you convince a child that his father is not the greatest thing on earth? And even if his father is harsh or cruel, he will still be convinced that he's good. You know, the other day, a while back at the Pete's clinic, somebody brought in a foster child. Well, it was with an OCS worker. And I mean, I thought about this. I'm going to try to make it quick. But the child, when I went into the room, was like, a, I, I actually thought to, in my mind, I was like, man, this this kid's almost like a feral child. What do you mean? Like some, some kid that was almost like raised in the mountains away from society because he was completely out of control. I mean, he couldn't have been five, six years old and he was like releasing words that you wouldn't believe and he was trying to scratch at the OCS worker. He was trying to kick at things. He was, te he was tearing the paper up. And at first, you know, as an authoritarian kind of person, I'm like, you know, what, what are we going to do about this? But then all of a sudden, now they know where he went. And he said, I miss my mom. And it broke my heart. Let me tell you, because he was in OCS because of neglect. He was in OCS because his parents hadn't been treating him right. And he's angry at the world and he doesn't understand what's going on. And he just, he just misses his parents. He just wants his parents to be right, to be able to do what's right. He doesn't even understand what that, what that even means, but you still can't convince him, even though they're not acting right, that, that he still believes that they're good. Even if his father's weak to him. He, he, even if a, a young boy's father is weak, you'll never convince him of that. His father would be the strongest man that ever walked the face of the earth. That's right, that's right. He believes that his father can provide whatever he needs. If he can just get the attention of his father, if he can just get his father involved in the situation, the problem's going to be corrected. And I mean real quick. He just, that's what a kid believes. I can remember that one time, you know, when I, one time somebody was putting up a backstop in a baseball field in Spring, Texas. And, and the guy I had his wrenches out there, I didn't even know what I was thinking. I ran, I'm, I'm going to get my dad to come help you. I ran home and I'm like, Dad, he was like sitting there on the chair watching the football game. And he, and I'm like, no, Dad, you need, that's the one time my dad got up and did something. Hallelujah. And he was out there and he was, let's work, let's get this thing done because my dad was a worker. You know, and, and but but I knew it. I, I knew, it, you know, that was the one time that, you know, hey, he got it done. Let's get her done, Right. And, and that's the way that a young boy would think. But God, our Father, is neither evil nor weak, and He longs to be included in our lives. I want you to know that. Amen. But it's really amazing, though, is that He has included us in what He's doing. Yes. He has a desire for us to ask Him to get involved in our lives, our circumstances, and He wants us to get involved with Him. But what He really loves is when our prayers begin to line up with His will. Amen. Then some things really start to happen. I was sharing with a young man, I'm not going to say his name, but he was telling me, man, Pastor Matt, I've been praying at night for this particular thing. I'm not going to say what it was. He said, I've been praying at night for this particular thing. I'm like, dude, that is awesome. Are you pray? I'm like, man, you pray at night? Praise God, dude. Young man praying. Hallelujah. That's so good. I get all fired up. I said, do you read? He's like, man, sometimes I forget. I said, well, look, I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to encourage you because this is something that I learned. When I started to read the word of God, it revolutionized my prayer life. Because, see, I went from praying what I thought I needed to praying what I knew his That's word so said that he was asking me to pray for. Because, you see, whether you like it or not, God has asked you and I. No, really, in the sense, he demands that his people operate and, and cooperate with him in order to move his hand. The business of man is prayer, and the business of God is answering prayer. And he's called a people to give their free will. 
and to release their free will to pray with him according to his will. And if we can start to learn how to mix the word of God and get the will of the Father in our heart and begin to pray that way, some amazing things can start to happen. I'm telling you, church, some amazing things can start to happen. Amen? Amen. See, in 1 John chapter 5, it says this. This is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. Amen. God wants to, listen, I can tell you that God wants to bless you. He does. He wants to bless you financially. He wants to bless your home. He wants to bless your marriage. He wants to bless your children. He wants to bless some things in your life. God is a blessing God. Hallelujah. Amen. But sometimes people aren't necessarily they're praying for so much blessing that they're not at, they're not even praying for God to bless people's lives with with salvation. They're not you, you listen. Pray according to His will, and whenever you start to learn how to enter into His presence, the Holy Spirit will start speaking to you, and you become more and more in tune with His voice. And as you become more in tune with His voice, you begin to hear His voice more clearly. Amen. That's the beauty of His word. Before I really started to read it, I know I've already said it, but now after I started to read his word, I started to realize what his word was saying. And now it's like your kingdom come, your will be done. Amen. You know, before I remember one of my old, my old pastor said this and he was pretty funny. People really liked him because he was a funny guy. But he, he said this, this is how his prayers used to be. And, and, and you might think it's a little funny too, maybe not. You might think it's irreverent, but he's like, I walk up there and I'm like, my name is Jimmy, what you gonna give me? <laughs> you know, like, I, I, come on, Lord, give me what you gonna, but the Lord wants us to learn to line up with his will yes. and to begin, and it's a beautiful thing that can begin to happen. But listen, it doesn't come overnight, my friend. It doesn't come overnight. I have learned some things about living for God. And one important thing is this, is that Jesus is in, is in me and Jesus in me wants to live through me. Amen. And so how do I learn to do it Jesus's way? In order to do what Jesus does, I must do what Jesus did. What did Jesus do? <laughs> Jesus prayed. <laughs> Our father who art in heaven. Jesus was in him and the father was in Jesus. And Paul said, Jesus is in us. In Galatians 2, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but he lives in in me. Jesus lives in me and he wants to live through me so that he can reach people that are hurting and that are lost. Jesus said that we're in him and the Father and, and this is what it says in John 17, that they may all be one even as you, Father, are in me, I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. See, there's a big part to when the Spirit of God on the inside of you and I begins to conform our behaviors and make us look more like Jesus and we actually start to look like it. You know, because the reality of it is that a lot of times we're willing to talk about people and we're willing to, oh, I'm sorry, we're willing, we're, we're willing to talk to people and we're willing to let people know about Jesus, but then our behavior contradicts the words that we're saying. And sometimes we really, and listen, I'm not trying to beat you up because we all go through a process where we learn to live for the Lord, but I'm just trying to make a point. One time the Lord told me, now I know he didn't talk to y'all like this, but this is how he told me, I need you to kind of just slow it down a little bit and just maybe not talk so much because this is the thing. You're saying one thing, but you're acting another way. And sometimes you're just messing up my brand. <laughs> Levi's were tough. And so if they get a hole in them, then they got to change their brand name because they ain't tough no more. And, and, and guess what? Christians operate in love. That's it. And Christians learn how to not gossip and slander and backbite. And Christians learn how to do a whole, and you're not, you just keep it quiet for a little bit and get along with me. Mm -hmm. and, and then let me work on me. And you're full of zeal, but you need, you need to let me, you need to let me do a work in your heart. So. Amen? Amen. In, in John 17, it also says this. In verses 22 through 23, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, you and me, I love this, that they may be perfected in unity is what the NASB says. I, I like people putting stuff on text church this morning. I'm just reading it. I'm like, dude, this is like, oh my God. Because I didn't go ahead this half of the text. It was already in. Okay. Praise God. I love it. I know. She's like, that man is preaching my message. No, the Spirit's just speaking. Amen. Amen. 
so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. So if he's in the Father, the Father's in him, and I am in them, and they are holy and righteous and kind and long-suffering, and he is healing the sick and walking in authority and teaching people how to live, then why don't his people look more like him? <laughs> That's a good one. Yes. We, need to, we need to ask that again. Mm -hmm. If he's in the Father, the Father's in him, I'm in them, they're holy, righteous, kind and true, long-suffering, healing the sick, walking in authority, why don't his people look more like him. And you can't say it's because they don't know. That, that sometimes is part of the problem. But look, you can't just say that it's because they don't know because look, some people are the most <laughs> overfed people in, in town. I mean, just so well fed, dude. They got a spiritual belly on them. Like, oh man, I know some stuff. Still don't act right. <laughs> See, matter of fact, Paul warned us that Knowledge puffs up. So if you got knowledge without love, then you don't really have much to stand on. Now at the same time, Habakkuk also said, my people perish because of what? A lack of knowledge. So knowledge is important, but it's got to be intermingled with love. Or else I just walk around here like, in, like full of arrogance and full of pride and thinking that I know everything and nobody else doesn't know anything. And that's not the Lord's will. You know, if you didn't know, know this before, I taught it a couple of weeks ago, that believers become a partaker of the divine nature. You remember I was talking about the helix of DNA and how whenever you get saved, when you truly get born again and you're old man, that's what the water baptism represents. Amen. It represents the grave. It represents the fact that when you heard the truth of, about Jesus, that you received a new life when you said, yes, Lord, when you believe by faith. That's what the word of God teaches. I'm just talking about born again just for a second right here. It wasn't in my notes, but let me just say this, that when the truth of the gospel goes forward and says that no, whether the world likes it is another story. I don't really care what the world likes anymore. I'm going to be a servant of the Lord. I'm going to speak the truth based upon what I have learned and what I believe and what has changed me. And if it gets me in trouble with the world, then so be it. But I'm just trying to make a point that when the truth of the gospel goes forward and your ears hear it and it resonates in your heart and you say yes to that, not just yes in your mind. I believe cognitively or intellectually that 2000 years ago, a 33 and a half year old Jew died on two pieces of wood. I believe that. You might even believe it intellectually that he died for your sin. I believe that. But it's got to go from here to here. Some people have said, you're going to miss heaven by 12 inches, my friend. Because you can believe it intellectually and never have let it settle in your heart. And until it settles in your heart, that's when the miracle of salvation takes place. When you receive it by faith and you'll know you got saved. How do you know? Not because you got dumped in water. Now, you're going to know because the Holy Spirit is going to come live in your heart. That's what it says in Ephesians 1.13. When the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart, He's going to start changing your life. Your mindset. And you might fight against it. I didn't plan on getting into all this. You might fight against it. You might try to rebel against it. But once you truly give your heart to the Lord, you don't belong to yourself anymore, my friend. The Word of God says, did you not know that you were bought with a price? You were bought with the precious blood of a lamb that was foreordained. This was God's plan before the foundation of the earth. He sent Jesus in his mind to die on the cross. Hallelujah. Before you ever even formed the earth. Earth. And when you align with God's word, a miracle will happen in your heart and he will transform your life. Amen. 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 And water baptism represents that outwardly what's already happened spiritually. Amen. But let's not denigrate water baptism. It's important. The Lord said, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Peter said, baptize them in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. It's me agreeing with the word of God. That is the blood that cleanses me. Hallelujah. And the old man born of Adam is going in the water. Listen, we ain't got to hold you down. They used to make jokes about that. Hold that one down a little bit longer, Pastor. No, you either saved or you're not. Hallelujah. I know I see some of them husbands smile. Hold them down there, Pastor. Praise God. Hey, let me just say this to the husbands. And I wish all y'all's husbands were here. 
You really want your wife to serve the Lord. Yeah. I'm telling you, you do. And you really want her to come to this church. <laughs> Let me tell you why. Because I'm going to preach the truth. What you're trying to say. I'm not only going to preach against myself. I'm also going to let them know that they, how they're supposed to act towards you. And then some of these women in here are like, you know, that's true. Now, I can't make them act the right way at the house. Anyone I can make you act the right way at the house. Come on, it ain't all the wife. And it ain't all the hubby. <laughs> we all got to get our head and our heart right. But I promise you that if a woman will learn the beauty of allowing Jesus to adorn her with his glory and his love and his humility. Oh, hallelujah. You'd be surprised what the Holy Spirit start doing in your house and in your life. And it goes the same way for the man. We are here like, I'm going to do it my way. Would you just go right ahead, buddy, and let me know how that works out for you next year. Because you've been doing it for 20 years and it ain't helped. You're right back in the same spot that you started in. You're like a, a car stuck in mud. And you, you think hitting the gas harder is going to help? No, it's not. You just dig it deeper, deeper, deeper. Sooner or later, I'm just ain't in my nose, but praise God. See, praying will get you to the place where this stuff makes sense. Spending time in prayer is going to get you to the place where some of this stuff starts making yeah. sense. And you keep digging a hole for yourself to the point where you're like, how in the world am I going to get out of this? Hallelujah, the Lord will. As soon as you, as soon as you stop pressing the gas, take off the gas, and call somebody for help. <laughs> yeah, it used to be all a song in the church. Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. Call him up. Call him up. Tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line now. Hallelujah. If you want the Holy Ghost. Tell him what you want. Praise God. That's a Pentecostal song right there. I know I look foolish. I know I don't sound good. But guess what? If you had to join the Lord in your heart like I do, you'd be ready to sing. And I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. He just poured it on me when I was in a bind. And I quit fighting against him, rebelling against him. And if I do it tonight, Lord, forgive me. Oh, help me, Lord. Okay. So they going in the water. Old man going to stay in the water. New man going to be resurrected. Amen. Praise God. And they're going to learn how to walk in Christ. And as, and as they start learning how to live for Jesus, like all of us in this place, we're going to start looking a little bit more like him and a little bit less like us. Amen. 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 And sometimes, wives, your husbands are going to do things to poke you. Come on. Let's just go ahead and preach it while we got everybody in here. Now, this is the, this is the best kind of preacher I am. Sometimes your husbands are going to poke you. Come on, just like I poke my wife. Hey, Lord, forgive me. I'm just going to be. Oh, Jesus, help me. Sometimes the, our husband, the husbands poke the wife. Sometimes the wives poke the husband. And then if you're not careful, then the, then the, wife, turned, then the, then the wife turns around or the husband turns around and tells, tells the, the wife, like my mama told me one time, Mom, I love you back there. How old are you now? No, how, uh, forgive me. 90? 89. 89 years old. Hallelujah. You're still kicking. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Whenever I first, when I, the Lord first set me on fire for Jesus, man, me, me and my mom were kind of like having some discussions and she, she turned around and she said, well, that's not very Christian. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I might have deserved it. I don't know. But boy, there's nothing that flustered my feathers worse than that. I probably shouldn't have told some of these men that. Oh, man, I flustered my feathers so bad, I thought I was about to blow a gasket. <laughs> but really and truly, what I'm trying to say is, is that if we would all learn to stop. Yeah. I used to preach this all the time when I do weddings. Somebody sooner or later got to shut up. <laughs> That's part of the problem that we run into. Nobody really wants to shut up. Right. <laughs> Even in a relationship with the Lord, sometimes I talk so much, the Lord's like, could you be quiet? Could you be still and, and know that I am God? Could you let me speak to you a little bit, son? Yeah. Right? Let's get back into prayer. That's a good thing, the thing about prayer is you spend time in the presence of the Lord. Sometimes you just got to be quiet and still and listen to yes. his voice and he'll lead you and guide you in truth. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We want to we want to heal and help others learn about the love of God. But do we ever stop and listen sometimes to what we sound like? You know, there can bitter and sweet waters flow from the same fountain. 
Well, they might be able to, but James said it ought not be brothers and sisters. Jesus said, he that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. You know, one of the things, there's another scripture that shows that, see, when living water flows, it brings life to what it touches. Praise God. Praise God. So a husband in this place, if you'd let the Lord get a hold of you and you'd start praying for your wife and start trying to learn how to love your wife, I'm preaching to the preacher. And for the wives in this place, if you'd start learning how to submit yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, it's going to make yourself a whole lot easier to learn submission in other areas of your life. Listen, there's a time I couldn't submit to no kind of authority. Like, I'm telling you right now, when I moved over here from Lafayette, Louisiana, with my hair down my back, I was a feral child. I remember I got my first car, and that policeman comes walking up to the door, and dude, I did not like the police. I'm sorry, Brother Curtis, I was disrespectful. <laughs> Thank you for your service, sir. Yes. That man come knocking up on my window, I'm like, Lord, what this dude want? I've not been beat by cops before with Billy Sticks. I ain't, look, I, I rolled my window down that much. I'm like, what you got, boss? You know? What a horrible, rebellious attitude. I didn't know how to submit to anybody, but praise God. And you think I'm going to submit? If I can't submit to authority, how, like, when you start learning how to submit to the will of God and learning how to submit to the word of God, you'll be amazed at how you can start to learn the process of submission. And then what's so amazing is when you submit to God's word, what he says, he said, he got some stuff in Ephesians 5 for you, for you wives. And he's got some stuff in Ephesians 6 for you husbands, right? I didn't, this isn't in my notes, but let me just say this. But listen, when we learn it, because the Lord said to do it. And when we learn to do that, wow, all of the sudden, the Holy Spirit starts moving and starts to change things and starts to work on your behalf. It doesn't always happen the way you want it to because sometimes there's still some things in you. It's kind of gross, but my old pastor used to say this too. You still got some boogers in your biscuit. Oh, and it's really God. gross. That is really gross. He used to say that. Everybody else liked it when he said it. I guess I don't really have that great of a sense of humor. But some things in your life, some dross, let's use biblical terms, some dross in your life. What is that? Impurities that's in metal. When you heat up the flame, it causes the dross to rise to the top where the refiner can see it. And he starts scraping it away. And then finally, you can start to see his reflection in there. So, look, we're talking about living water and everything that it touches. It says in Revelation 22 that the Lord showed John a river. It was pure as crystal and it flowed from the throne room of God and from the Lamb and that on each side of it was the tree of life and that the trees bore their fruit every month. And so what I'm seeing here is the river of life and everything, there's a song, it says, and everything that it touches can, what has this, the words go? And everything that it touches can be revived, I think is what it says. It is a river of life that comes from the throne room of God, and everything that it touches comes to life. And, this, and Jesus said that out of your bellies will flow rivers of living water. He's talking about the Spirit of God who had not come yet because he hadn't gone to the cross yet. But when you get saved, the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you. And if you'll spend time in the presence of God, hallelujah, the next thing you know, out of your belly will start flowing rivers of living water. And everything that the river of life touches can be restored, can be revived. There's resurrection power in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He makes dead things live. I don't care how bad it looks. I don't care how, how dark it seems. The ministry of the Holy Spirit will cause life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if we're well taught and know right from wrong, and we know that we should allow the river of life and not rivers of death flow out of us, and we know that sweet water, not bitter water, should flow, then why? Well, what's the problem sometimes? Could it be, this is just one question. I might, you might think I'm wrong, and maybe so. Okay, I'm not the end all be all. I'm just one man. Could it be that while we know about our father, that we don't really know him? Yes. Could it be that we're more like Job before the trial compared to how he was after the trial? It says in Job chapter 42, verses 3 through 6, it says, this is Job talking. 
I have declared that which I did not understand. I don't know about you, but I can admit that. Yeah. I've done a whole lot of declaration about some things that I thought I knew about, and I'm realizing now maybe I didn't know. It would be a good thing for, for preachers to pray. <laughs> And then listen, we ain't still ain't going to get it all right, but praise God, if we get in the presence of the Lord, we're going to learn some things and, hum and be humble. He says, I've declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear now, and I will speak. I will ask you, and you instruct me. I'm about to talk, Lord, and I'm asking you to instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. Mm. See, sometimes you got to go through some things for the Lord to be able to begin to break you down and to show you that, no, you're not okay. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I've learned after I've been in life for a little while, not just being a pastor, but being in healthcare, I'm a nurse practitioner for like 26 years. I've dealt with a lot of parents. I've dealt with a lot of children. I've dealt with a lot of sick people. I've dealt with a lot of human beings in a lot of different capacities. I've been in the oil field. Okay, I've been, I've been around the block a couple of times. And one thing that I find is this, is that people oftentimes always got somebody else to blame. <laughs> it's always somebody else's fault. I'm not trying to say that bad things didn't happen to you. I'm not trying to say that bad things didn't happen to me. But at some point in time, we got to stand up. We got to wake up. We got to become a man. The Apostle Paul said when I was a child, I did childish things. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. There comes a time in our life that we got to get up, stand up, and to be a man. And to come to the real, be a woman, and come to the realization that, yes, people hurt me, but Jesus wants to heal me. And if I let him heal, then you just go on. You don't let Jesus heal you if that's what you want. No, 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 I like this victim mentality. I like living in this victim mentality. Oh, you preach too hard now? Don't preach hard enough? Because sometimes we can sit here and we can have a victim mentality and we will never let ourselves be made whole. Jesus walked up to the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. He reached out and he said, will you be made whole? I'm here. I'm here to set you free. But the question is, will you be made whole? Whole. Will you let Jesus heal you? Yes. Amen. So Job, he said, I'm about to talk to you, Lord. Hear me, please. Instruct me, please. That's prayer. Job's going to the Lord. He's in a bind. Sometimes these trials and tribulations in our lives, man, that's the time to get a hold of them. Father, oh, Father, I need you. I just know that if I could get you caught up in this situation right here, that you could fix this thing. I need you to help me, Lord. Lord, teach us to pray. See, when I pray, I speak to him. When I speak to him, he speaks to me. And the more I speak with him, the more intimate we become. The more intimate we become, the more sensitive I become to his voice. I put this little, shh. Did you hear that? <laughs> I know that voice. That's my father. The Holy Spirit is bringing me a word. I'm just trying to tell you, like, just imagine I'm on the phone with you. And then all of a sudden, shh, that's the Holy Spirit. He's bringing me a word from my father in heaven. i got to let you go. The Lord's calling me. Yeah. You, you understand? What, you ever been that way? I've done this before where I'm in the car and there's something, like, all of a sudden the Lord's like, I want to I spend some time with you. And I'm driving and I'm like about... 10 minutes away, I'm just going to be real with you. This kind of stuff will happen. About 10 minutes away from a place where I can stop and get along with the Lord. Or I can get along with the Lord right then and ever. Then the phone rings. And instead of not answering it, I just answer it. And then the next thing you know, that moment is lost. Okay, I'm not saying you can't go get another moment. That's not what I'm trying to say. But when the Holy Spirit starts speaking and he's trying to call upon your name. I, there have been times. I don't know what they think I'm going to the bathroom for, but there have been times I've gone in the bathroom at work and I've got on my knees and then on the bathroom floor. And that's what I'm doing. Weird. Okay, that's fine. And I'm like, Lord, I look, why? Because I felt his presence and he was drawing me. And I'm like, no, I'm not putting you off till after work. I want to talk to you now. Sometimes it only takes three, four minutes, but praise God. I want him to know I, I hear you, Lord. I hear you. I feel you. And I want to keep hearing you. And I want to keep feeling you. So hallelujah. I'm going to get along with you. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Teach us to pray, Lord. You know, I'm not talking about praying for somebody right now. We got a church full of people. that, Like right now, if you, got, you say you got pain in your body, I guarantee about 10, 15 people get them to lay hands on you and pray for you right now. And praise God for people like that in the church. Amen.
Yeah. That's not what I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about praying to the Lord. I'm talking about spending time in, his, in God's presence. Individually and corporately. Jesus said that his father's house would be a house of prayer. So we're going to pray in this church. Amen. And the disciples said, teach us how to pray. And then somebody might say, yeah, but I don't like to pray like that. And you're kind of getting on my nerves with all this talk about prayer. Well, if you don't pray, let me just say this. If you don't pray, don't get mad at me. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to help you. I'm really trying to help you. I know you don't know, some of you don't know me, but I promise you, I really do want to help. Okay, <laughs> there's a lot that rolls through my head, but anyway, I promise you I want to help. So if you don't pray, if you're not a person of prayer, you might be getting irritated right now. So much so that you want to get up and walk out. And I remember days in my Christianity that I didn't pray and the preacher would pray, preach on prayer. And then my flesh would get irritated. And, and if people, let me just say this, if people get bristled about prayer, I think it's an interesting thing. You know, it's like, wow, that guy's operating in a word of knowledge. No, I'm not. I've been, if you're being bristled by my message right now and you're being irritated, it's not a word of knowledge. I remember when I felt that way. And I'm trying to tell you that it's, it's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not going to make you aggravated when a preacher preaches on prayer. It's a spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. Yes, yes. And if you do pray, then you feel great right now. You're like, yeah, keep it coming, preacher. Amen. Right? Amen. See, if I preach about Halloween, Mardi Gras, or AA, and you like those things and it makes you mad, that's one thing. I mean, I'm still going to preach what I believe. Okay, but 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 I can I can at least understand that. I can get it. You're like, man, you don't know, dude, these things. Okay, I get what you're saying. If we sat down and I explained to you my position, you might understand where I'm coming from. I, but I, I do, I at least understand that. Okay, but, but, but what I don't understand is if I'm a preacher in a church and I'm preaching on prayer and somebody's flesh gets irritated about it, then that person actually has a very serious spiritual problem. No, really. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we may not like to hear this, but that person actually has a serious spiritual problem. At least right now they do. But I believe you came to the perfect church. Amen. I believe you came to the perfect church. And I. And why do I think that? Because I'm going to let you know that in this place right here, right now, you can get some medicine for that problem. Yes. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the anointing of the Holy Spirit can reach into your heart. And I'm believing that the Lord will break you out of this spiritual problem that you have right now in the name of Jesus. I believe I declare it in the spiritual realm that you will be broken and you will be set free from an irritation about prayer. And that instead you will become a person that's hungry for prayer and that the Lord will put you on a trail, a pathway, and there'll be a fire of God coming behind you because everywhere that you go you're going to live for the Lord and listen to me <laughs> if that happens to you on the day that the Lord comes back for his church or on the day that you breathe your last breath on earth, earth if that happens to you you're going to thank me I mean you'll thank the Lord speaking through me that's what I'm trying to say because you will stand before your Lord and you will hear well done my good and faithful servant I mean, that's what I, that's my prayer. If you can hear my prayers when I'm by myself praying for the church, that's my prayer, Lord, because that's been my prayer for myself for years. And there's been times that the Lord not shown up, I would not have heard those words. I'm here to tell you, even as a pastor, there were times in my life that I thought I was doing things right. Okay, and again, you can crumble it up and throw it in my face. I've had people that like to do that. It's okay. I'm going to keep offering my own faults and failures to try to help other people because the Holy Spirit told me to do that. He doesn't ask every preacher to do that. Most preachers don't want to do that. I don't sometimes want to do it, but the Lord told me what to do. That's one of the little tools in the little kit or one of the weapons that he's given me. Use yourself as an example. So I'm going to let you know that I was over here praying and I was saying, Lord, please, when I see you, let me hear those words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And here recently, and some of this stuff is up between me and the Lord. So you don't need to try to figure every little thing out because you got your own stuff. You need to let the Lord deal with you about, okay? But what I'm trying to say is this, is that the Lord showed me, son, had I not shown up for you, 
You wouldn't have heard those words that you've been praying for. And so now whenever I pray for the church and I pray for you, I pray, Lord, I pray that when they see your face on that day, they would hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. You can sit down here on this earth, and then you can, I'm just using some people. You can work at Metal Shark. You can work wherever you work, whatever your job is. I'm not picking on a particular person. Work at this clinic, work at that clinic, work for this company, work for that company. You can be the best employee. You can show up 5 o'clock, leave at 9 o'clock. Do everything your boss has and things that he doesn't even ask. And guess what? You can end up on the other side. You either believe this or you don't. Like what I'm trying to say, I get it. We got a room of people. Some people will click on the video. They'll turn it off. And, and I get it. If, you're not, if you don't believe Jesus has really done what the Bible says he did, if you have not been born again, if the Holy Spirit does not live on the inside of you, then what I'm saying don't make any sense whatsoever because the Bible says the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit for they are spiritually understood. If you're going to operate in your natural mind, the things that I'm saying make absolutely no sense whatsoever. But if you are born again and the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, even though sometimes you might get irritated by something that's said, it ought to resonate on the inside. And you may, you may be thinking, Lord, on that day I want to hear the those words because think about that if the word of God and when I say if sometimes I talk to people that don't even believe in the Bible and I use the conjunction if because I and I'll tell them I'm using if because I don't know if you believe the way I do but you let me talk so here we go if the Bible's right, that's what's going to happen because I've read it enough times to know that one day we're going to stand before the Lord and we're going to give an account. Yeah. Some people are going to go to the white throne judgment because they rejected the message of Jesus Christ and did not receive their second birth. They were born once in Adam, born in sin, but they rejected the gospel when they could have been born again. That's another thing that kills me. You know, I used to, I'm a, by the grace of God, I'm a witness. And so sometimes I'll be out there with it. I'm a Christian, dude. I'm just not one of them born again Christians. Well, then you ain't a Christian, boss. <laughs> Jesus told Nicodemus, the religious leader, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That's right. Amen. Well, how do I get born again? I'm glad you asked right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Right now in the name of Jesus. If anything that you've heard makes sense and you don't know whether you're born again, you can just invite him into your heart right now. Uh, you can say it to the Lord in your heart, in your mind, I believe that. I believe there's something in me that's telling me what he said is right. That the first natural birth, I will, I'm not right, Lord. But I want to be right with you. Right now, with your heart, you can speak this to Jesus. And you can say, with your heart, you can say, Jesus, come into my heart. I believe you died for me because you had no sin. I believe you rose from the dead because the wages of sin is death. Forgive me of my stuff. Come live in my heart. Fill me with your spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. I listen, I believe that if people would pray that prayer, and listen, if you prayed that prayer, and it's the first time you ever prayed that prayer, tell your husband, tell your, tell your wife, tell some family member today, let them say, you know what, I prayed that prayer. And then when you get along with the Lord, I'm going to tell you something. Because listen, I'm the guy, I'm not going to sit here and beg people to come to the front. Whenever the preacher told me that I needed Jesus, and she didn't tell me, she didn't say, Matt Abair, she said, somebody in this place, you need Jesus. And my heart started beating out of my chest. I had physiological changes to my body, and I ran to the altar. <laughs> Back in them days, people weren't, like, I ran to the altar because I knew that she was talking to me, and I got down on my knees, and I lifted my hands in the air, and I got up a different man. I was far from a perfect man, but I was different on that day. And so I just want to encourage you, listen, if you be busy with the Lord, you get home with the Lord at night. You don't have, you get on your knees by the side of your bed and you can even wait till your loved one's in the bathroom. I don't know when you're going to do it, but you'll figure it out. And then when you do it, you confess it with your mouth because the Bible says you got to believe in your heart and confess it with your mouth. 
that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. And when you do that, miracles start to happen on the inside. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Just learn to pray. You know, I was thinking about young people. I put this in here. Appreciate y'all's patience today. Look, young people don't realize this, but the devil is scared. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you right now, the devil is scared of young people. What you talking about? I dare a young person. No, y'all don't need to listen to me right now. Just give me five minutes and y'all can go back to sleep. You know, I know sometimes as the, as the pastor, I get on these kids' nerves. I can tell it. But it's not me irritating them. The devil don't want them to hear what I got to say. The devil wants to keep them irritated. The devil don't want them to hear what I got to say because the devil is scared of you. Because if you as a young person, a young lady, a young man yes. would dare to get along with the Lord and begin to cry out to God. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Ha! Because, see, you're, listen, you're, who are you spending time with, my friend? No, I'm talking about all of you young people. I'm talking about you adults, too. Who are we spending time with? Right, right. <laughs> Come on. Uh -oh. Spending time. I, I know I've been fussing about them, but I'm trying to make a point. Spending time on Netflix. Spending time, I don't know, hopefully you don't have Grand Theft Auto, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> spending time in some of these games, but I don't know what the games say, but some of y'all, some of y'all know. No, somebody told me like one time, and I know I've said it recently, but one time Robert and I went to pray for a girl who said that she had the spirit, I know I've said this recently, sorry if y'all feel like I'm repeating, but she said she had the spirit of Wheezy. Like uh, Lil, Lil Wayne had taken her over. So we're in, we walk up in this house and we go, to, we go to pray for this house. And in the midst of it, the little kids, the kid couldn't have been, I don't know, four or five maybe, playing Grand Theft Auto. And it's, they're talking about passing bombs and they're talking about all this other kind of stuff. And I'm just thinking to myself, no, 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 really, think about this. If you're a Christian, I'm just saying, if you're a Christian, okay, it, it, what the Word of God says. All right, if these people are over here constantly playing these games and they're in this world that they're living in, okay, and it's like, it's a normal thing to, oh yeah, pass the bomb, dude, and go ahead and shift it into fifth, bro, and let's get that, I don't know, it's great. It, they're still in cars. So, so these kids are living in this world, and this is who they're fellowshipping with. And I know y'all hear me say this a lot, but this is sometimes the best, best way I know how to say it. It's kind of like, do people think that, that they're really going to be fellowshipping in hell? Because, see, that's the kind of thing that people think. At least that's what I thought. When I used to sing ACDC and Van Halen in the 80s when I was growing up, I'm on a highway to hell. My friends are going to be there, too. I don't know I say this a lot, but it's, I don't know how better to communicate. It's not going to be like pass the bomb, dude. That's not what's going to be happening in hell. But we get deceived by a spirit that tells us, that, oh yeah, dude, party on, bro, crash the beer can on your head, you know, whatever we used to do. I know y'all probably didn't act foolish like that, that's what I did. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is this, is that there's not going to be a party down there. And, and then some of you young people, y'all hang out with other kids, some of you young ladies, y'all hang out with, with other people, and it's like, that girl is sitting there talking about that other girl that y'all were just talking to, and she's gossiping behind that girl's back, and she's slandering that girl, and then she's acting that way towards her. As soon as you leave, she's probably doing the same thing. Why are you even saying all that, preacher? Because I'm trying to let you know something. We get so concerned about what people are going to think about us, and the devil is scared. The devil is scared that young people would actually get on their knees, spend time in the presence of God, and learn how to hear the voice of God, and get filled with the Holy Ghost, and start to get the boldness of a lion on the inside, and quit worrying about what all these other people are thinking. Listen, if you can ask any of these adults in this place. I guarantee you they remember times when they thought somebody in their life was important and they thought that this person that they went to school with was important and that that person was speaking negative things into their life and now they're thinking, how in the world did I let that even happen? And either that or you, or you were the one that was being me. And, and, and if we would learn to spend time in the presence of God and to hear what God says, and even as an adult, Sometimes when the Lord started getting a hold of me, you know, at first I would be apprehensive to talk about Jesus. 
And then after my sister died tragically and the Holy Spirit healed me. Like, dude, I was a mess. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And I started spending time in his presence. I started thinking, you jokers. <laughs> y'all had me fooled. I thought I cared about what y'all thought about me. Now I've gotten a revelation. I've gotten an epiphany. I don't care a plug nickel what you think, what people think about me. Well, sometimes I do, but up here I feel real bold. I don't care a plug nickel what you think about me. I'm going to talk about my Jesus in public because he's worthy. And Jesus said that if you're ashamed of me in front of men, I'm going to be ashamed of you in front of my Father and the holy angels. Now look, that doesn't work you trying to do it in your own strength. But it will work if you spend some time in the presence of the Lord. If you learn how to get intimate with Jesus, hallelujah. If you learn how to pray and get the word of God in you, he'll start to do something on the inside of you. And listen, and he will give you promotion, my friend. Hallelujah. He will promote you. He will make you the best you that you can be because that's one of the things that the Lord wants to do. He wants to make you the most productive person on the job so you can't talk about Jesus. He wants to make you the person that doesn't call into work. Come on, somebody. Help me out. Well, why do you want me to call into work, preacher? Because when you call into work, somebody else got to do your job. <laughs> when you, look, oh, so I can't ever call into work. That's not what I said. I'm trying to make a point. When you call into work, somebody else has to do your job. <laughs> Like daddy used to say, suck it up. And he didn't say this, but I'm, suck it up in the spirit. Come on. Now, if you're supposed to take, you, you get what I'm trying to say? I'm trying to make a point. Especially people that call in all the time. I don't know why I'm going off on this, but I am. People that call in all the time, they put added pressure on the people around them. And then you want to talk about Jesus. No. He wants to fill you up with the Spirit. He wants to give you fortitude. He wants to give you endurance. He wants to give you strength. He wants you to get up and to do the right thing. And then hallelujah, then they're going to listen. And as you begin to speak for the Lord, because you're helping people. Amen? Amen. They don't always want to hear what you have to say. One of the things that I learned when I was working at that last hospital that I'm not really working at anymore, and I'm just going to be real quick with it. Like, I'm, I watch some people. I watch people. And so it's like everybody's got a job. And I have one boss that thinks everybody should only do their job. Techs do tech work. Nurses do nurses work. Secretary do secretary work. Providers do provider work. One of the things I've noticed is, is that some of the providers will put their orders in. Like, I, we can do this in five minutes. Person comes through triage, boop, 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 flu swap, COVID swap, boop, and then on their phone. And everybody's running around trying to do their thing. And I'm just thinking to myself, I'm about to be talking about Jesus up in this place. So I'm not going to give them any reason why they're not going to like me. So I put in the order and I say, hey, why are you still asking them questions? Why don't you type? Let me do these swabs for you. Put it in, put the orders in the computer. Hey, look, while you're doing that, I'm going to just go ahead and run these swabs over to the lab for you. Oh, man, you don't have to. No, 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 I'm going to do that. And then, you know, try to start my own. I'm not trying to build myself up. I know that sounds weird. You got to be careful about that. That's not what I'm doing. I'm trying to make a point. Sometimes we get lazy in the workplace and people see it. And they notice it. And what I'm trying to say is, is that the Holy Spirit wants to make us better workers, harder workers. And then when we start to talk about the things of God, people are going to be more open. And it's time in prayer and the word of God mixed together that will reveal these things to you. The book of Ephesians says, don't work as a man pleaser. That's right. I used to have a restaurant, somebody washing dishes, and when I was looking at them, it was like soap suds were flying all up in the air. And then I kind of put my head down for a second and did this, and it was like, and I thought of that scripture. You're not supposed to work as a man pleaser. You're supposed to work knowing that the Lord is your boss. Amen. People around here, not say around here, people that love serving the Lord, they really operate in this, under a spirit of laziness. I don't, something need to hear that today because yeah. that, that didn't plan on that coming out. But anyway, you start acting like the person you spend the most time with. If you're not careful, you'll turn into a gossip, right? right. If you spend time in his presence, you know what I want you to know? You're spending time in the presence of the potter. And the potter's job is to mold a lump of clay. And your father in heaven already knows what he wants you to look like. You know that? Because in Romans 8 and 29, it says this. That those whom he predestined, though he had foreknowledge, and guess what he wanted to do? He wanted to conform them into the image of his son. See, the father already has a prototype. He knows what he wants you to look like. He knows what he wants 
me to look like. And when we get into his word and we begin to learn his word, then we spend time in prayer. See, this is why you got to spend time in prayer. You can know as much as you want to know about the word of God. But when you start getting intimate with the presence of the Lord, the Holy Spirit makes that part real to you. And he begins to reveal that to you for your own life. And then you can then say, Lord, please help me in this area. Amen. But if we don't learn prayer and intimacy with the Father and learn how to hear his voice and let him unveil his plan for our lives. You know, some of you in this place next year, you'll probably be in a different city. I mean, you may. You might be in a different city with a different job and maybe even in a different church. It's possible. Uh, but, but guess what? If you don't learn how to get intimate with the Lord, if you haven't learned how to get intimate with the Lord, and you don't learn how to get intimate with the Lord... The newness of the new job, the new city, and the new church, it's going to wear on also. And you're going to end up right back in the same spot that you were. But if you allow God to change things and start getting along with the Lord and spending time in prayer, even if it just starts off as small things, I'm telling you, God will show up. Amen. 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 You know, the Father made it possible to pray. It's all about access. Amen. <laughs> he made it possible for you to cry out to heaven to be heard because he made it possible for you to be his child. And this father listens to his children. I recently had a conversation with a person. I'm not going to say who, but they were talking about the privilege of being able to have access. This person talked about their grandfather and how at times he would let her come into his workshop. And she felt like that was a privilege to be able to be in there with him. And, you know, I told her that she was privileged. And my shop story is a little different. I'm not saying this so you'll feel sorry for me. I'm trying to make a point. My shop story was different. My dad, I remember specifically, we lived in Spring, Texas. And I'm not trying to beat up my dad. It just is what it is. We lived in Spring, Texas. And I walked into his, where he was doing his shop work. And I was like, hey, dad, what you doing? And I was probably about six, maybe seven. He said, and with it, through his hung over eyes, said, what do you want, boy? Get the blank out of here. All right? And, you know, was it hurtful? Yeah. And again, I don't tell you that so you feel sorry for me. I tell you that so you know I don't know where I'd be right now had I not learned through pain and sorrow when my sister died how to connect God to God through prayer. Does tragedy have to happen for you to learn how to get intimate? No. But unfortunately, many times, we're just caught up in our own little thing. I, I'm doing my own thing. And we don't take the time to get along with the Lord. So, my, and you know, let me just say this about dads. My dad, my poor dad did not mean to hurt me. Oh, no, this is a word this morning when I was reading this. I feel like the Lord wanted me to speak this. And maybe even to some young people, but, but to anybody that would listen. Your dad didn't mean to hurt you. I'm sorry, he did not mean to hurt you. He got caught in a trap. It's called the snare of the fowler. It's Psalm 91. The Lord said he'll deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Whoever your dad is, wherever your dad is, whatever your dad did, and that you feel like a result of hurt from it, I promise you right now, or whenever he, he one day your dad is going to wish that he did not get caught in that trap. And the enemy wants you to be hard towards your dad, but you can make a difference. You can get your heart soft towards the Lord, your father in heaven, and you can pray for that person. And the Lord will do a work. I'm not going to tell you that they're going to be set on fire. There's no telling what God can do. But men ought always to pray and not faint. They ought not get exhausted. They ought not grow weary. Praise God. Don't let the devil steal from you the importance of you understanding that you have a father in heaven. He says it in John chapter 1 verses 12 through 13. As many as received him to them gave me power to be the sons of God. Even to them that believed on his name. Jesus' name. Which were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of God. Praise God. Stand in my message. Maybe the singers and musicians could come forward. You know, he made a way for us to be able to call him Father. 
When Jesus died, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 27, verse 51, that the veil was torn. Throughout the Old Testament, that veil separated the holy place from the holy of holies. We've talked on that recently. Where the Ark of the Covenant was located with the Ten Commandments, and there was a mercy seat on top that had two cherub, cherubim, which are forms of angels. And once a year, the high priest would apply blood on the mercy seat. He would turn it from a place of judgment to a place of mercy. But when Jesus died on the cross, he was the fulfillment of the sacrificial system. In the Old Testament, see the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 10 that the blood of bulls and goats could not remove sin. But Jesus' sacrifice removes sin. The Bible says, I'm just telling you what it says. The Bible says that when Jesus, he said, it is finished. And he breathed out his last breath. The Bible says that the earth started to quake. And that the veil was torn. And now this is the thing. I, I don't know if you believe it, but I believe it. <laughs> the veil was, they said, it was about the, the breadth of a man's hand, embroidered fabric. It said, Josephus, the Jewish historian, said that two yoke of oxen couldn't have torn it in half. And that it was ripped, history says it was ripped from the top to the bottom. In the midst of that earthquake, when all that other stuff was going on, God reached down there and whoosh, and he ripped that veil. Matthew tells us it signified that we now have access into the presence of God. You as a son have a father that made a way that you can access him. That you can learn how to pray to him. And this first message this morning on prayer was just to try to encourage you. Man, look, find some time to get along with the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Let's worship the Lord.